a lot of people will privately, including major pop stars, will privately talk to me and say, I agree with you. And I actually read that book. There was, I think in 2022, Marcus Mumford said they begged you to stay. Did you feel like you had that support? Uh, no one begged me to say. What you got to remember about the New York Times is that in the 1930s, they shilled for Hitler. In yeah. the 1950s, they shilled for Stalin. And in the late 50s, they shilled for uh, Ca Fidel Castro. So I tell you what, if, if the New York Times don't approve, that's a good thing. You don't want to be approved by the New York Times. You're not in good company. I actually just had a... I had debated Nancy Pelosi last week. What's she like? What's Nancy Pelosi like? Well... Don't get me wrong, I use the word yeah. like radical, I, I use it to, to, to mean people who practice political extremism or violence, political right. violence. So I would use the word radical then. Yes. So I would say radical right and that's it, or, or radical progressives. I actually prefer to say radical progressives and Antifa, because that's almost like right. a, a word that gets people's backs up right. and it's not helpful. Right. Um, so I, I'm not against using the word radical. Yeah. And there's also terms where I'd be like... Well, when I was a kid, radical, radical. <laughs> you're rad, you're rad. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like that right. word. Right. Uh, but so I, 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 I'm just curious about the, the meaning of it's that. It's like so. Charlie Sheen in his classic interview. He's like, oh, radical people. Like when he used it there, he wasn't talking about wing nuts. He was talking about Sean Penn and Liam Neeson, people who were cool, you yeah. know, that yeah. reached out there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, wow, we are graced with the presence of Winston Marshall today. This is incredible. Did you bring your banjo by chance? <laughs> I thought that you would. Yeah, I'm going to bring it for you. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. I'm, I'm thrilled for your success. And it's. Uh, Thank you. It's, I, I like to meet people looking for the, the sensible middle yeah. and not afraid to speak to people from all sides. Because right. I think that's how we get through all of this. Call uh, me old fashioned. You, you call me, you, uh, we could not agree more. I think if polarizations an existential issue and what it looks like it's funny too because most people as we've learned traveling the country they feel generally the way we feel where they're tired of having to walk on eggshells or be so tribal or lose friendships or family relationships over politics people are exhausted with yeah, it yeah. it's not natural it's not healthy it's killing communities it's hurting families we're tired of it yeah. it's ruined careers yeah You've it's the great tragedy of the time, you know, that the, and this doesn't get caught, covered in media because media normally covers stories, right? So or like news stories. But one of the things I've hear, I've hear about the last eight years, particularly since 2016, is the amount of friend groups and families and marriages that have broken down utterly needlessly over difference on politics, or because it's got to such a point where the division is so vast now that people can't keep normal relationships. That, that to me is, that's the tragedy of the of the era, amongst other tragedies, but <laughs> yeah, the, one, the, un, the unreported one. one. Yeah, <laughs> do, you, do you see that in the UK the same way in the US? <laughs> For sure. In, in the UK, it happened around Brexit. Brexit tore up. I know, I think I know three relationships that broke up because of Brexit. And um, it's uh, since then, probably n not, although COVID, kind of split people up again if people fell on different it was weird since 2016 we basically had and it got turbocharged since 2020 every right. year there's a new topic that just cuts through the middle of everything 2020 the pandemic 2021 the uh, russia ukraine war 2022 what was 22 there was something in 22 now it's uh gaza ukraine right. uh, yeah. gaza right. um israel you know every year there's something that just i think russia ukraine had a sequel that ran back to back years yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's was, quite possible yeah. i mean the the gaza stuff that we're seeing Seeing, uh, come to New York and see what's going on on right. the university campuses, Gaza Plaza up the uh, up the road. That is to me, it looks like the same people as the BLM stuff from twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I. What do you think? Is that if I got that right or wrong? Yeah, I mean, I think it's more about social. It's more about a social group, frankly, than any beliefs. Yeah, like I, you, you look at a lot of people and a lot of the conversations you have, and both both my roommates here in New York are at Columbia Law, so uh -huh. they're they're every day and they're in the group chats. And it's the same kind of ideas and the same kind of like approach to things that you that we saw in 2020 across the country. I, I think it's kind of like you have the same core activist class. Mm -hmm. And we know this because we, in our early Roka days, we launched summer 2020. And our first road trip when we were just sort of going past the polling, we wanted to talk to normal people across the country. What do you viewed? And uh, view the news. And so we... In our conversations, and you know, we'd always hear, oh, the same sides kind of tyrannically control the narratives and, and they only push their own agenda. But part of that too is we wanted to go to the more extreme rallies, whether a Trump rally or a BLM rallies. 
And the people you see at the gods and campus, I just passed the NYU one, which is, you know, 80,000 a year college. It, you could just see it's an activist class and you interview them and sure Fox News will cherry pick the dumbest takes yeah. to make to totally discredit it. There are some educated people there, but we've interviewed them and there are also a lot of super uneducated people uh -huh. that just seem to be there because oppressor press framework yeah. we've figured out who's on which team. And so we're going to go all in and now take over Hamilton Hall. I mean, what's your take? Yeah. It's a similar yeah. thing in, in London. There are some very smart people who, who take both sides. Yeah. Um, but for sure, I mean, uh, friends of mine, Trigonometry did an interview, did a, a, a report as did unheard, by the way, they did, both of them did coverage where they, interview people on the marches in London. I think there's been 13 marches I saw now that since from October, Constantine. Since Constantine. Yeah. And they couldn't name the river yeah. from the river to the sea. They couldn't name the river. They couldn't name the sea. They couldn't right. tell you what year Israel had been formed. They say, oh, for 100 years. Well, actually, Israel didn't exist 100 years ago. What are you talking about? Yeah. If you actually pick them up on it, they, it's, right. it's a dead conversation. Right. So it's it's there's a curious thing there. I think there's, there's something to do with social media's massively turbocharged. I see it yeah. As a, yeah. with this a new era. I mean, this is something Jonathan hates going into a little bit in his book, which I'm in, in the middle of reading. But the, the, the impact of 2000... 9, 10, 11, 12, Facebook, Instagram, introducing the like button, re the retweeting, all of that stuff. That's kind of when the beginning of this nonsense or this new era, I think, began. I think there's a few other things tied in there. I think that the, the bailout in 2008 is a big yeah. part of that and the larger populist worldwide movement that's going on. But in this, the, the, a lot of this, what we're seeing is, is a social media Right, the it's anxious like the generation social. that is that, that the new book talking about how exactly, but yeah, and there's I think there's also a general lack of meaning for so many people, and when something like this comes around, it's like oh great, perfect like per totally. perfect timing. Oh totally. yeah, totally. I mean, you look at I mean beyond just anecdotes and the interviews we've done, the organizer of the Columbia protest is a uh, young man by the name Kamani James. And he was an activist in high school. He actually went to Boston Latin School, which is the biggest feeder of Harvard. It's an exam school. He got there, very rough childhood, but he resigned from the student councils he was on in high school over the George Floyd protests. He was super active in that. He sort of developed this mentality of abrasive um, activism where, where you make people feel uncomfortable, confrontational activism. Mm. So he's just a good example of now he's wearing the kafia. How do you pronounce it? Yeah. Yeah. Kafia. And now he's wearing that, but four years ago, uh, you know, middle of those. So I, I, there's yeah. definitely a core. I, and again, are there, you know, obviously passions based on heritage and people who are more educated, who are from the middle East, um, who, who know what they're talking about. Absolutely. But that core there's, it's something that, so Mary Harrington, who is actually going to be speaking at dissident dialogues, uh, this weekend, she, she, and she's a great author and, and sort of reactionary fe feminist is what she mm. calls herself. She calls this the omni cause mm. in which it's, mm. it's one giant thing that seems to be the the giant lump of causes that everyone seems to be following and that's so i see a kind of the current things i've heard yeah. that framework yeah so dissident dialogues yeah well that's what i'm here to promote yes <laughs> <laughs> we, thank you i hope this get com we, gets published in time you know <laughs> you're a nerd you know you're a nerd when this feels like a music festival like where you see the lineup <laughs> and you're like oh no way if, you know it, it it just feels like oh and then even even the next tier which is like the smaller edm artists uh, yeah, you're yeah. kind of like oh wow they've got alex o'connor well that's that's the vibe we wanted to do right yeah. so it was I come from music industry background. Obviously, We've heard, and I want, and we used to put on festivals all over America, or over the world, and take yeah. over tiny towns. And we, I kind of wanted to take that approach to this world. So coming to this world, I noticed there's uh, everyone's kind of engaging online, and I would meet all these people partly because they would reach out to me, and I'm very social, so I would meet them, and I noticed that everyone's sort of alone. And there was a desire for community. I was like, okay, well, that was one thing. I was like, mm, maybe we can, how can we bring people together? And the other thing I noticed was that in, there are some ideas, festivals type things. I, I've spoken to a, a couple. Um, I spoke at Freedom Fest as a libertarian festival. I'm not a libertarian, but I spoke uh, uh, there last summer. And there's a couple others across the across the world. But some of them, and this the very famous case that happened with Coleman Hughes at TED, where, and he wrote about this in the free press, but he 
wrote, uh, he, he gave a lecture, a keynote, about called Colorblind and defending the case for a colorblind society. And there was a contingency within TED that tried to have the speech censored from their, not published rather, censored is probably not the appropriate word, not mm -hmm. published from their, on, on their YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so it occurred to me, oh, wow, so the, there's actually a bent of censorship within these things and, and there's a political leaning of within these festivals. So I think we should have a festival where you can actually, it, all, all strokes all of ideas, diversity of opinion is celebrated mm. and try and bring uh, people like around, uh, you know, the, bring back that community sense. So it's, and and um, hopefully, if I'm right, if there is a, you know, if the market wants diversity of, the, of opinion, if it, then people will like this. And they are, the, you know, they've bought the tickets. So, so it should be, it should be uh, a kind of, yeah. Another thing I wanted to do was not be, um, I kind of didn't want it to be sort of, tweed jackets <laughs> I, wanted, right, I was right, like let's do right. ideas festival but like leather jackets yeah, yeah, like yeah, that's yeah, the kind yeah. of yeah. the atmosphere we wanted to create so you know it's going to be beers on the water and uh in brooklyn in brooklyn yeah. and food trucks and so, so hopefully kind of got a, a relaxed vi a vibe to it we'll, we'll see we'll see it's, it's kind of a risk but it's, it should be fun were you always involved or not even involved but like have you always been interested in this kind of stuff or was it after what happened in 2021 that you started to get engaged? I've always been interested in this stuff. My, you know, uh, my family is, I've got journalists and writers and authors. And so it's like the dinner table. I can't, I couldn't tell that I, whether I was weird or different. You guys <laughs> obviously readers and thinkers. Right. And, but I, not necessarily everyone is, you know, it's like only 1% of people really read articles every day. It's, it's not really what people um, do. But I, I actually had this feeling at home and because I, come to New York and have a place down, downtown and and um, I used to live here and I remember reading all these people that are on the festival and just thinking oh and like you know reading people like Pinker or Dawkins or Ian and and now I'm like wow I was you know they were these intellectuals and brilliant right. minds and and some of them someone like Ian or Mazia right. Linajad were yeah. total heroes li right. li dissidents incredibly brave dissident legends who had escaped persecution were exiles and now they're all coming together so for me it's like wow like the world that i was by some weird curious sequence of events that i could never have predicted and should definitely wouldn't have chosen yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i've been thrown yeah the, oh, okay yeah i do I, yeah. yeah i guess this is what this is what's happening anyway that's well, not very well articulated version. no no no, no. no. I, I think that's i mean First of all, I think there almost needs to be a cultural fitness craze phenomenon that needs to take place around dissident dialogue type events because it is healthy to get exposure to alternative viewpoints. And right now the social media landscape makes you so cozy, so comfortable in your echo chamber where, first of all, they structurally prevent you from getting exposure to other ideas because the feed does not reward content you don't engage with. So obviously you're not, so you feel so cozy, so comfortable in this, in this area, but that's not healthy. And it's, it's not healthy for the country. It's not healthy for critical thinking. Mm. It's not healthy for anybody involved except for the social media platforms and also for media publishers who mm. benefit from having this audience that they feed stuff they already believe over and over and over. And it's insane. And one thing that I find so sinister about all this is the labeling that takes place and i think people who don't pay close attention fall prey to it so for example some of the people in dissonant dialogues you bring up coleman hughes people who he's call not him, actually unfortunately right, we couldn't I, get him but I, yes but, but john he mccorder's would, john similar, he, yeah, he's yeah. on it and he's yeah. a similar thing people will label them they labeled you as something you're not and mm. it's so tyrannical because most people are casual consumers as you say so they'll hear about winston and they'll be like Oh wait, he's far right, mm. or Constantine Kizen, he's far right. Coleman Hughes, he's right wing. Joe Rogan, he's right wing. Yeah, and they're not. Yeah, it just, it just. I mean, how do you feel when you see yourself labeled and you're like, I'm not this way. Like this, you can't. Just you know, that's it's a, it's a good question, and it's actually it's why part it's part of the mess we're in because the first time when you get called these things, like you get called fascist or far right, which right. by the way is. Right. So unbelievably, believably ludicrous. My family literally, 
escaped the Nazis because they were Jews, most of them were killed. So the idea of being called Nazi yeah. and fascist is just like, yeah. what? Like, are you joking? <laughs> Fascism has not yeah. But, but there's a bunch of words that say far right, racist or anti-Semite or fascist that you just don't want to be called. You don't want that word attached to you. And so actually that's what why there's a censorship that's been going on. It's because it's actually a very effective way of people it's to so shut up. It's like, don't you, you know, look at J.K. Rowling. She gets called all these nonsense things. Like she gets called a fascist or a transphobe when she's not any of those things. It's, it's and insane. And it's, it keeps yeah. people, I know loads of people in the music industry who uh, would agree, but just like don't dare not touch the topic because once you're tarred with the brush, you can't be untarred. You can't be cleaned of it. What happened when you click tweet on that, message in 2021 that, that led all this to come down <laughs> I, mean, I mean i mean like you click like you click the button then did you immediately start seeing responses or did, was it a day later you woke up you checked your dms and you're like wow i'm in deep shit it was it was it wasn't like like a a bomb it 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 kind of grew and grew and i thought oh no just leave it it'll it'll die like it can't but then it just kept going and it was over the course of a weekend and I just thought, oh, it would die. But then it just kept growing and going up all the trending lists, in, in certainly in my country and I think in this country. And by the end of the weekend, so just for your listeners who don't know, I tweeted, I was tweeting about books through the pandemic that I'd right. been reading to my not very many followers. On Twitter, I had, the fact, 3,000 followers. So not really anyone. This tweet, I tweeted about a book called unmasked by Andy No, so an American conservative journalist, um, Vietnamese American, and uh, it documents the BLM riots of 2020, the 19 people killed in the first 14 days. It documents all the Antifa behavior, including the whole month of June 2020, when the Portland Federal Courthouse was under siege, under insur insurrection, lit like technically insurrection. And I... It, I don't know how, but it, it blew up. Maybe I was, I, in fact, not maybe, I was naive into how Twitter worked. And, you know, you don't get to choose what hill you die on. And I was quite, it's annoying when you die on what might be a molehill. Um, but it, it what, in the, so from the point of view of the music industry, like BLM, everyone supported, like if you remember Black Square Tuesday, like you had to put out a Black Square. That was, they, they erected a picket line that if you didn't, you couldn't, not if you didn't post a black square, you were against it. And th th look up what ha happened to the band Hanson. They posted a, a, a black square like a day late or something. I can't remember exact details. And they got you know in all sorts of <laughs> trouble for it. It was it, the, the hysteria at that time. Wait, was, did Mumford and Sons post anything? Do you remember? I I think um, yeah, I think we did. Right. Um, and I wouldn't have. I was pretty affected by the George Floyd thing, to be honest, and and pretty emotional about it. Um, I, I I would say I had a slightly more nuanced take, but I was I I didn't support Black Lives Matter the organization. Right. I'd read all the literature, Patrice Khan right. Colors. Before that, I was living in New York. Everyone was talking about BLM and these kind of things. So I I was brushed up. I knew that they were a Marxist organization. I knew that um, it was anti-family. Uh, I, I if I didn't know, I was soon to know that they were anti-Israel. And you know, um, I, pr I I knew that they were extreme. Yeah. And then look what look what they did with the money. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you couldn't, you couldn't. I didn't appreciate that this topic. It was a slightly different story in England. I didn't quite appreciate how divisive the issues here in America. And but <laughs> oh, by the end of two days, it was a segment on Tucker and the View, and I was like, what the hell? But the the more significantly, it was like in my personal life and in my business life, all the phone calls start happening, and it's like. That was a horrible time that I, I don't particularly like to uh, <laughs> to relive. But I will say, um, I, I, through it all, having stuck with my guns and having gone down a path that I didn't anticipate or could never have imagined, I, um, I'm very glad to have kept my soul and my dignity uh, through it all, you know, um, which that's, I say that so that if anyone's in such a position where they're self-censoring or nodding along with things they shouldn't do, has someone now, if that's three years ago, having gone through it all, I'm like, I'm so glad I like kept my dignity or at least I 
I feel like I kept my dignity. Did you at least, despite that incredible turmoil, was there an outpouring of support? Did you feel at least some level of embrace then? I was very surprised by that. I think that letter got read over a million times. Oh it, goes, it got read. Yeah. Th that medium piece, I think, was like 600,000 or 650, but then it got got reshared on other other media mm -hmm. outlets like the Daily Mail, I think the New York Post or something. They, they put it out. My feeling at the time, the, the period before that, so again, this is not the whole story has been said here, but initially after the tweet, I apologized to try and kill it because it was like kicking a hornet's nest. They, they came, all these activists came after not just me, they came after my whole band and their families and things like threatening, to, you know, to hurt us, hurt them. Uh, things like uh, going on, uh, someone went onto my Wikipedia page that night and changed it from Wikip uh, Winston Marshall is a banjo player to Winston Marshall is a fascist. <laughs> and my, I had a friend like helping me out, changing it back. But they, she was up all night because they kept changing it back. And I think it changed like six times. They, they do everything they can to destroy your reputation. Um, and so I, I wanted to kill all of that. And I was like, maybe I don't know everything about this topic. Like I just read one book. Like maybe I, well, I, I mean, I knew quite a lot about the topic. <laughs> but I was still open to, you know, thine ignorance of thine ignorance is thy fearest foe. You can, I, I was I accepted happily that I might not know the whole story. So then I looked into it. I issued this apology. Uh, uh, I spent a few months really getting into it, like uh, looking into the topic. What my what were my blind spots? What have I, I made, made wrong? And eventually, I mean, again, I've said this story so many times, so your listeners can find it elsewhere, but eventually uh, decided to publish the letter as you described and basically retracted my apology but the only way i could do that for various reasons i had to quit the band as well so it and then it it got it, as you say it kind of had a, a viral moment now but but at that point by the time i published the letter i just needed to clear my conscience i wasn't sleeping i wasn't eating i was like i've been part of the lie like this letter this uh, apologizing when i'd done nothing wrong i was like what if i had kids like i'd be like such an embarrassing dad huh. i like basically a cuck that I had to do this letter. It's just, it was hum utterly humiliating for me. So the the point for me, and, and there's other aspects too, like I'm a musician, our job is the pursuit of truth. So if I have this letter, like whatever I put out now is, it's like, it, it's degraded by the that letter. It, it, it lo loses impact because I'm not, an, there's an amazing, Salt and Nitzen piece called Live Not By Lies that he published in 1974, um, I think on the eve of his expulsion from Moscow. And I, I'd read that maybe five times. It kept hitting me. And it, it's, um, you, should, you should read it. And there's one particular paragraph that's saying, if you call yourself, how dare you call yourself an artist if you're not prepared to live by the truth or pursue the truth? I can't remember the exact words. And that kept hitting me. And so... For me, when we put for when I published, it was about getting my dignity and my soul back, and I and I did. So my initial response was like, <sighs> like my conscience is clean. So I was like, I kind of could relax then after three months of like inner turmoil, inner turmoil. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's a very long story short. Were would you <laughs> were you short. <laughs> were you expelled from the music industry, or did a lot of people keep ties with you after that? A weird thing happened. There, there's certainly a few people in the industry that I stay friends with. And funnily enough, so um, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed one. A lot of people will privately, including major pop stars, will privately talk to me and say, I agree with you. And I actually read that book. Did you get mad it. though, that they weren't speaking yeah. out in your defense? At some point I would have been like, come on, can we have someone step up? Uh, it's like, I know what it's like. If they could lose a lot. And I understand how big a sacrifice that is, and why should they throw it away over something right. they don't necessarily know? Um, it, it, it's true that it, all of these things need to create a critical mass. Like if yeah. a lot of people have been like, "What the fuck is this ridiculous story?" Yeah. I had actually said something. Yeah, it would have been uh, thrown away. It goes back to what we were saying earlier about um, people self-centering because if you speak out, you know they're scared yeah. of the tar. Yeah. Um, Sorry, what was the question? Sorry, I interrupted that. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, Solzhenitsyn, you? Solzhenitsyn, your parallel would be being exiled from 
the music industry. Oh, well, so yeah, I speak to people in the music industry still. And funnily enough, since I've been outspoken against anti-Semitism and outspoken on Israel, actually a lot of my friends who are Jews in the industry will speak to me saying, thank you for writing this article. Thank you for d doing this interview because they cannot speak because there's a, <laughs> I, I, this is a theory, right? I don't actually know this is true, but this is my theory is that there's a, the, the industry, you might think it's controlled by the elders who are the CEOs or whatever, but actually it, the, the people who generate the money are artists aged between 15 and 25. Like that's where the, big stars are and huh. so if you and again this is just theory but if those people are so like adamant about not working people with the wrong opinions they might literally not work with a manager or not work at a label if they see they don't want to be associated with another person who's on there so associating with me although the adults some of the adults are very happy to still see me privately but I suspect that it's not necessarily in their b professional interests to, to work with me. Having said that, some of them said they would, and um, it's it's not entirely. I you know I I have I put my, I did a U.S. solo tour. I put out a Christmas single, so I'm still making music, and I, I'm sitting on I'm nearly finished the record, so I I still Ooh, make music. It's just yeah. um, uh, it's but it is the case that um. That in the music industry, there's that in the artist section, I'm kind of the tricky one. To <laughs> <laughs> there's an asterisk, uh, but, it, but it's not. I, I'm certainly never going to claim I'm like completely ostracized. It's more complicated than that. It's um, and and I can put out music. And there's artists. Look at someone like Ariel Pink who went to the. Trump, uh, the the Jan six Trump yeah. rally. Not he didn't go to the Capitol Hill yeah. storming, but he went to the preceding rally, and he got com dropped from his record label. and And he'd be a good guy for you to bring on yeah. the show. He's a, he's a fun one, <laughs> and um, you know, and he's still putting out music. And you could still put out music independently, and right. you don't need a label anymore. Look what happened to Oliver Anthony. Right, um, blew up without really much yeah. support. Just you just right. need to, great songs and some. A, you know, some heart. So before we go back to dissident dialogues and some of the larger cultural issues, just on your story, one thing that we talked about is the lack of courage around you. And I, I respect what you said, where you're kind of like, if one of these big names were to speak up on your behalf, they'd be falling on their sword, potentially risking their career. Uh, a lot of people's success and reputations around them, this sort of gravy train they're on, bringing it to a crashing halt. So I get, it's a lot to sacrifice. The band, Mumford & Sons. There was, I think in 2022, Marcus Mumford said they begged you to stay. Did you feel like you had that support? Uh, no one begged me to stay. So initially I was invited to stay, but the terms were I had to apologize and there had to be action. And uh, it, it was made clear to me that I would have to go along with the lie about all these politics things. Then when I explained my situation where it had, it was affecting me and I couldn't see a way forward, there was no pushback at all. So that's, that's not true that that happened, but maybe there's a different interpretation on the other side, but it's not for me to say, but. Did that drive you crazy them knowing you for that long? And it's been, very, it's been a very difficult time. Uh, yeah. Um, it's, it was it's still. Difficult. Yeah. yeah. So to bring it back to the present day here. So then you left, and like you're saying before, you you got into media with a pod, yeah. with a podcast, yeah. and now you've continued to grow out into this brand, the Distant Dialogues. Um, what I don't know. What was that transformation like? How, how easy was it for you to get into this? Were there a lot of people who were really eager to help you? At uh, a certain point, I was like, um, after uh, it happened, at a certain point, I was like, I made all this sacrifice to speak what I think, it would be kind of crazy now to like, just not say what I thought. Uh, now I, I will add to that. So then I start, I moved, I worked, uh, I, I got a job at the spectator with a podcast. Uh, it, it actually took me a while to un self censor myself because I huh. trained myself and it wasn't just in that period, even before the political correctness in the music industry 
was at such that for a few years it was like don't you know don't say the wrong thing and they the music journalists always wanted to talk about politics even though it had nothing to do with the music so that uh i had to learn to just speak freely and now i feel like now i'm free now i can, <laughs> okay. I can like say we hope you feel free in here we yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 um and so i actually just had a I debated Nancy Pelosi last week. I saw that I'm, Oxford Union. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. It's about not this. up oh, yet, though, right? It's not up yet, but okay. It was like, it felt good to say. Let's go. What, what was the topic? Not saying populism. We dated, yeah, to populism, yeah. debating populism, and for me, it was. I think the last couple of years has been building up to that. Um, oh, that's it's, so. Cool. It's really worth. What's she like? What's Nancy Pelosi like? Well. <laughs> She's a great stock trader. I don't know if you asked for any investment tips. Yeah, if we were made, I wouldn't have won that debate. <laughs> Lockheed's going up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, she, well, I'd say before the debate, she was very nice. Yeah. And perfectly pleasant. Yes. Did photographs and it's very, very sweet. But during the debate, she got up to interrupt me a couple of times. She was seething. She was in her seat, turning around, going, who is this guy? Who is this guy? How, why are you doing this? Trying, you know, going wow. for me whilst I was doing my, uh, giving my speech. And then afterwards stormed off furious, utterly furious with what I'd said. So. Your viewers will have to oh, see what I is it that I wait said for this. that so, and I yeah. did avoid ad hominem. I just, I just, let's say I'd called her out on some, some a, apparent ap hypocrisies in her politics. Interesting. She was not pleased with. Interesting. What, what was more nerve wracking, being in that debate stage against Nancy Pelosi or performing to a sold out arena? You know, it's so funny going to these arenas, like you don't even real. By the time you're actually playing in arenas, like every night for 10 years, you've been doing like one extra, one size up or like 10 extra people every night. So that by the time you're doing it, it's like, ah. Eh. So, th so that, <laughs> yeah, that, that's how it works. we did Madison Square Gardens, yeah. Garden, we'd already done like uh, Barclay yeah. Center a couple of times, which is bigger. So yeah. it's like, yeah, it's MSG, but. We, we, we were, when we were looking up the Mumford and Sons uh, from your era there, uh, this the stats, this is kind of like a backhanded compliment because we obviously listen to Babel. I, I still listen to Mumford and Sons song, mm -hmm. but like, it's like you guys are even more successful than we realized. You know, yeah, like, I'm mean, crazy. You, you were the stars aligned. Yeah. The stars yeah. aligned. Yeah. But, but it is, it is kind of, we, we were thinking like that, that must be an interesting pivot where now you're at the Oxford union and uh, yeah. very different. Do you feel more personally judged when you're performing music or when you're sharing your own well, ideas? As you guys know, in the idea space, we were talking yeah. before we started rolling that yeah. whatever you say, someone's going to take umbrage yeah. with what you're saying. Someone's going to be upset or offended or right. disagree or and disagree in such a way they want you to shut up. Yeah. Um, to be honest, that's kind of the case. There's a correlation. The more successful you are, the more more you you attract hatred or you attract detractors. Right. If anything, it's a sign that you're doing something right. Absolutely. Nothing worse than saying something into the wind. And, and absolutely, you know, that's a good thing. I well, think. well, I think too that one of the steps that. Um, you know, most of the Roca audience, the community, you know, we have a cr terrific relationship. We love, I mean, we are just so unbelievably grateful and, and heartened every time we leave New York, especially, and you go out in the country and you meet normal, happy people. They have very similar views of the news. They're tired of being told what to think. And we built this community that's very diverse. Now, some people like Joe Rogan follow, which is great, but mostly it's a younger audience and a very diverse following. Cory Booker, Lisa Stefanik, Mark Cube, you know, it's all over the place. But we, uh, some people still who just kind of like maybe their friends followed, so they checked out Roka and, and you'll see some of the hate comments we get. And so we've had some of the dissidents on like an unreleased episode with Alex Berenson. We interviewed, our first interview was with the Harvard doctor who was fired for his views on the vaccine. Martin he's, Kuldorf. Yeah. There yeah, he yeah. is. Yeah, he's fantastic. We spent yeah. a lot of time with him. Um, such a mild manner guy. It's so funny to yeah. see like the They're so genteel. These so people. genteel. So, so to yeah, see so, the monster create yeah, and then this you is meet what is something I've been thinking about. And this is actually, I think this is something I might have talked about with Barry on on her post, podcast. But 
well, these people, like you mentioned Martin Kulldorff or someone like Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, who yep. was, did, did the Great Barrington Declaration yep. with Martin, yep. uh, Dr. Kulldorff, I should say, I've never met him. <laughs> never Marty, met him. yeah. Marty! <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Barry, yeah. and they're very, well, these people are very genteel and soft, and, and you, they're not, but now there are some people who are antagonistic, narcissistic bullies, and they just want attention, and, they, they, and you see that. I'm not going to name names because I don't think it's right. a bit rude, but I would say that there's a big bulk of people who are not that and quite soft and not, you know, I'm high trait, high trait agreeableness. I'm not a disagreeable person. Um, so it's kind of, and, and there's people like that. And you think, what, what is it that brings all these people? Like, how is it that these, this weird group of people emerged from the last four years as kind of outliers or ostracized from their universities or industries or whatever it is? And I don't know what it is exactly, but and maybe this ties into the beginning of our conversation. It's something to do with, they all have a, set, a strong sense of the, the metaphysical self. I had this conversation with um, Jay Bhattacharya as well, I think on my podcast, but what it, it's, you know, we look at like the people in Gaza Plaza or the, or the Antifa or the BLM lot and they have their identities. Is it because we've taken away, because God is gone? And this is a question, I don't know the answer. I'm thinking out loud. If God is gone and we, so then what we have is our identities, but our identities have to be something sort of physical or material. And then if anyone challenges them, we have to defend them with our life. Whereas if you, if you are, if your identity is something metaphysical, your sense of soul you're in relationship, I'm a Christian. So it's, for me, that's where it is. It's like, you can, I don't really, I can sort of shield some of those yeah. terms that we talk about, but the most important thing is soul and truth. Then I think that's kind of what's going on. You know, yeah. Barry's uh, practicing um, Jew and, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya is Christian, and I think that that ma makes a difference. Yeah, I'm, exci I'm excited for the Ion uh, Richard Dawkins debate because I even think yeah. Dawkins, and if you don't know, he's one of the new atheists, and not just one of the, he is the yeah. face of, of, yeah. of intellectual sort of atheism, which some people would say is redundant, but we wouldn't. I'm religious as well. Um, but, and he's even argued that there, there was sort of a benefit of cultural Christianity. Now, in terms of, Something a point Max Frost made earlier. Um, I think you're 100. percent I mean, uh, there's data that show that young people have replaced traditional pillars of meaning, um, like faith, with politics. For example, when people looking are looking for a dating partner, politics are more important than religion. That used to not even be close to the case, where people, a significant chunk, won't date anyone of the opposite political persuasion. It used to be true of religion. Another is, more society writ large, the pillars of community have sort of disintegrated. Um, family has deteriorated. The number of meals you eat with the family per week. All these sort of metrics you can have about the traditional pillars of meaning friends. Young people see mm. friends less than they used to. This is the work of Jonathan Hyde, Greg Lukianoff is going to be there. Yeah. Uh, others. So long story short is, objectively, people have replaced the traditional sources of meaning with politics and Arthur Brooks, a social scientist at Harvard talks about, you know, people with bumper stickers are less likely to be happy. Like that's a, that's a finding. Yeah, so it's yeah. really interesting. And I think you see this with oh, peers, really? right? Yeah. That, totally. Yeah, that, yeah. I mean, people have to have something right. That drives them, that gives them meeting. And it's like, especially a lot of people, you know, we're sitting here in Manhattan how many people work in some high rise building where they're one of 200,000 employees and they want, they want something to drive them forward. And you know, for better, or for worse, especially, I think a lot of generations try to do the opposite of the older generation, right? They want to get rid of religion. They want to get rid of, you know, the patriarchy, all these, all these different kind of things. But yeah, something has to replace it. Yeah. And it's interesting. A lot of these new atheists who are so influential against the, you know, against the woke movement or kind of whatever. Yeah. I mean, obviously this is a criticism, right? Is you can do that. And then what follows it, well, exactly what you're fighting against. Well, no, no, <laughs> so, and and yeah. at Dissident Dialogues, Alex O'Connor is going to be having this debate with John Vivekey, the meaning crisis, where they, I mm. think they both probably will find common ground in accepting that there is... Uh, the, 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 all of these posts, so almost pagan faiths like wokeism or uh, environmentalism are a result of the removal of God, but they won't probably, I think Viveki is a, is a, a theist and O'Connor is an atheist. So, so how, how can we, how do we create meaning hmm. in a world when 
not everyone you, when you can't prove God and not everyone is necessarily a believer. And that's also Dawkins versus Ian. Ian went from being in the Muslim Brotherhood to a famous. She wasn't in the four horses of the, oh, of yeah, the apocalypse, yeah. or horsemen of the apocalypse, but she was certainly a yeah. very prominent yeah. new atheist, along yeah. with um, uh, Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so, uh, uh, yeah, she's going to be having that debate with Dawkins, and she's now a Christian. Uh, you know, fi I think that I think that question is very important. Uh, a friend of mine, Peter Bogosian, actually, uh, oh, yeah, maybe yeah. you've had him yeah. on your show. He said something recently earlier because he's also another new atheist and he's written about it and and um, prominent in that in that world. He said to me privately, "It's like maybe better to believe someone walked on water two thousand oh. years ago than all this nonsense that we're seeing now. Like maybe you know we all make a leap of faith at some point, but maybe some leaps of faith are." healthier than others well the, you know what's so weird is there's this strange alliance that is has taken place between new atheists and practicing religious people and then outside of that alliance are more the two polar ends of the spectrum where sort of the woke left and what some people are not calling the woke right obviously they don't share the ideological tenets of the woke left but their tactics are very similar canceling um i think there's sort of a salem witch trial that goes into anyone who's ever pictured with Bill Gates or ever took a dollar from a certain group, even if it was one droplet in their pool of funding, you know, they're, they're all, anyone who supports Israel is a Zionist sellout. Yeah. Even if, even if you disagree with the Israeli funding, the, you know, there, there's this sort of weird effect. So, but, but like where Pinker is now agreeing, who, who's upholding, in other words, classical liberalism today, it feels like there are two forces. The atheists like Pinker who believe reason is transcendent and then sort of natural law proponents who believe in civility discourse and are more moderate. I, I there's just a strange alliance. Yeah. I don't know I don't know how to describe like Ben Shapiro with those people. He's religious and and they see the world very similarly. Dave Rubin. Yeah. What's um, exciting to me though is yeah. that the atheist bunch, even Dawkins now, I think he's always probably said he's a cultural Christian, but recognizes that some of the nonsense that we've seen in the last few years is a result of the success of the new atheist movement mm. that they really killed god mm. they and, and and convincingly so and so then what happened oh well then there's a lot of people who have completely meaningless lives yeah and they have to have meaning it's not like you can live without meaning right you can't you can okay, we've tried yeah. we've tried right now we've tried right now we don't have any of those pillars i'm single i've got nothing yeah yeah oh if this is a meaningless life, it's going very well good, 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 good. Well, well i'm curious uh before you know i think we we're talking about the term radical right radical right mm. uh that's an, the ben shapiro example is interesting because have you followed this whole thing with candace owens and Loosely, I, I, not enough that I could comment on it. Well, what, what I'm curious is kind of like where you draw the, because so much of this, it's so hard to draw a line, right? Between, for example, whatever. I, I guess I put it to you this way, with the distant dialogues, right? You're trying to bring in as many diverse perspectives as possible. Yeah. Is there a line that you, is there any line that you would draw mm. anywhere? And what's the line? That is a good question. Yeah, there are actually lines that I, there's some topics I just don't see the point in. I, I think race IQ, I don't like why I don't, I don't understand why one would, I don't see what's to be gained from that thing. And it's not, it's for me, it's a very icky conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that means that I'm a, uh, you know, a pussy and, and <laughs> not really a dissident after all, but I was about I, to call you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, that's not a topic that I, I don't want eugenics at my, yeah. anything to do with, I think I don't want uh, the, yeah, particularly, I think, you know, I, I, I do believe in free speech and I'm not saying that people shouldn't be allowed to talk about that, but I don't think that that's something I, I also believe in constructive conversations. Right. And I think that conversations should have, there should be something positive. There should be something meaningful that we can all agree why it's meaningful to have the conversation in the first place. So, that's an easy question. What about you? What, what, who would you not have on the show? Mm. We asked our audience uh, in our app, we do polls. Um, we can put polls within stories. So we asked our audience, if Hitler wanted to come on our podcast, would you want Hitler? Would you want us to interview Hitler? Uh -huh. And 80% said yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, would, okay, I, well, would I sit here with Hitler? I certainly don't think I would. However, I don't, I don't, I mean, there's a natural 
People, I mean, shouldn't it, it would depend on who Hitler was, right, at the time, and it would depend on who anyone is at the time. I do think the tendency of sweeping ideas yeah, under the rug, Hitler, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pre World War, no, uh, no, well, like, 1944, <laughs> well, yeah, Hitler, yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah. The, I mean, the more an idea is swept, the more an idea is sil- the more an idea is silenced, the more traction it gains. I mean, they threw well, him in jail and he penned Mein Kampf and he came out and gave it to the world. I, th- I think, uh, yeah, oh, I think a lot, of, I think a lot matters, like context, for example. An event would we, you know, I think that's, I hate the verb platform. We hate it so much because it implies endorsement and it rarely is where you're kind of like, you're platforming this speaker, this view. And it, I mean, people have said, because it's so early in the show, they're like, oh, you've had a bunch of these anti-vax people on. By the way, we're always going to skew people who aren't represented by the mainstream media because that's a big part of the niche we fill. So even though we'll try to get both sides of an issue, we're always going to skew people who are acting in good faith, who are smart. Um, and good faith is a key. Yeah, good faith is a qualifier. Yeah. But like, I, for example, for you know, like Tucker and Putin, I think they're. I think the context matters. So would Putin belong at a conference? I don't know. But like for an interview for news company, yeah, I think so. But then there's another thing: is how do you conduct the interview? I mean, if you're doing softball interview, uh, softball questions, that that's kind of. I mean, if it were 1939 and, you know, Hitler wanted to tell the American people his beliefs, shouldn't the American people have been aware of what he thought? I mean, I, I, know, mean, that, I know that's I, not I, a perfect I example. I, but yeah. No, that is a good example. It, yeah. I, and I think it's very good to interview Putin, even at a conference, because yeah. it's people, it, it's, to not interview, interview him assumes that the audience is stupid that's and great. can't work out for that's themselves great. whether something's evil or not. It's, right. it, you're, you, I'm pro Putin yeah, at a conference now. That's a good. Point. Yeah, so yeah. it's. I think it's great that Tucker yeah. interviewed Putin. And by the way, uh, uh, it's not easy to interview someone because you don't know where they're going to go with totally. it. And so, from his point of view, Putin took an angle that was like, "What the bloody hell?" <laughs> like, if I was interviewing Putin at that point, I'd be like, "Okay, wait, what? Like, how do we?" I'm, I'm uh, glad <laughs> when we ask you tell your story about you know that 21 tweet that you were in, like so. Uh, the Magna Carta in 1215. <laughs> yeah, you, know, yeah. you just start in the 13th century, just like, like, how do you interrupt that? Plus, he's in Russian. I don't know. That was quite yeah, exactly. Tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. Good uh, faith is key, though. Yeah, good faith is good faith is key. I, uh, there's there's one guy I, I wouldn't I would have. I mean, look, when I I posted a photograph with Pelosi after our debate, and I lost a lot of followers. Really. And for me, it's like, and because people hate her in this country, I didn't realize how much they hate her. They hate her. <laughs> They hate her. They hate her. <laughs> I, say, I say she's part of like she's part of like the four horsemen of, of yeah, hated politicians yeah. in America. Right, right, right. right. Um, yeah. But so I but I'm not scared to have a photograph with her. But having and, and I would definitely have her on my podcast. There are some characters I wouldn't I wouldn't have Nick Fuentes anywhere near. Yeah. I, I I that guy I like I fucking hate him. Like I'm angry. Yeah. At I do, and, and and someone who another person I don't necessarily know that much, but I just don't find interesting is Andrew Tate. I don't think he's got anything interesting to yeah. say, and I don't think he's yeah. adds anything anything of value. So I, why wouldn't I give? It? But yeah. again, it's I'm, not- I'm with you. But I, I I think with the latter, I think he's in a creation. What a lot of people miss is I'm with you, but I think he's a creation of this vilification of 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 uh, masculinity and this sort of void that it's left where people feel this tug from what their coastal liberal teachers are telling them and how bad their masculinity is and the patriarchy, let's dismantle, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah. And then their natural biological instincts and depictions and culture, and they're kind of like, but I, I totally well, agree. I, well, sorry. well and, and then they kicked him off social media and his celebrity skyrocketed. Yeah, yes, exactly. 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 Andrew Tate's what you get when you... you you vilify Jordan Peterson for like years and years right. and years, trying right. to get rid of him, say he's la 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 ha yeah. for ages. <laughs> and then then what happens? Okay, then you, you make him bad. And then where do you think the kids are gonna go? Yeah. They go they go really to like the extremes. And that's kind of what I think is Tate's done. So you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's just a surface. Totally, level. totally. I mean, um and I think the New York Times and the Atlantic and places like that have nobody to blame but themselves. Like you think of the books they write fawning profiles over there's just one called white rural rage and maybe you agree with the thesis that white people are the biggest threat to democracy because they're more racist misogynist homophobic go to go through i the don't litany. agree with that thesis well it's i'm saying the generic thesis. you i figured that's you a racist I that's a racist wouldn't. thesis yeah but like that book on msnbc and new york times got praise and now people will hear us say that and they'll be like uh, go after Fox News, which we do all the time. Fox News throws red meat to an audience, boosts anger, and creates subrational narratives about crime, migrants, and other groups that I think are false, even if you agree with some of the, like, all sorts of problems. But the problem is New York Times is such authority. So when New York Times and The Atlantic wrote pieces on Jordan Peterson early, he was put in a bubble. And ever since then, he's kind of like uh, been forced to just spar with Wokies all the time mm. in a way that I think has probably shifted 
his outlook a little bit. Mm. You know, um, you've got to remember about the New York Times. Is that in the 1930s, they shilled for Hitler. Yeah. In the 1950s, they shilled for Stalin. And in the late 50s, they shilled for uh, Fidel Castro. So I tell you what, if, if the New York Times don't approve, that's a good thing. You don't want to be approved by the New York Times. You're not in good company. That's my take that's, on that. That's a so great take. I, I think that's, that's a great take right disgusting, there. disgusting um, organization. And uh, well, another thing, actually, let's talk more, more about the present. I don't know if you saw both the correspondence dinner yeah. uh, that Colin Joseph speaks yeah. uh, with Biden and then also Biden on Howard Stern. Yeah. Now, Jost finished his piece with this like, oh... You're, you know, the best thing about you, Biden, is that you're um, you're so, what was the word he used? Um, decent. Yeah, decency. Yeah. Decency. Oh, we're just, I'm just so grateful for yeah. your decency. Yeah. Your decency. Oh, I don't care that the world's burning. I don't care that there's war in Ukraine and, and, and Russia and Gaza and Israel and Afghanistan and Taiwan on the brink. Because decency. And by the way, Biden's not decent. All that Colin Jost meant by that was that Trump isn't decent in Joseph's opinion. He doesn't think that Biden's decent. No one thinks that Biden's decent. What they think is Trump is deplorable. And then Howard Stern. And Howard Stern. Oh, the father of the country. Ugh, the most ingratiating. And then Drew see? Barrymore with Kamala Harris saying, we need you to be Mamala. Oh, like uh, these people, they're supposed <laughs> to be journalists. What they, it's, they're shills. It's a propaganda machine. It's so embarrassing. But you know, you've been at the top. I mean, is it, is this like pervasive or people oh, just, yeah. Sell, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the creative industries, Hollywood and, and music. Now it's slightly more complicated because I, and this comes into personality types. And this is something that we mentioned Jonathan High earlier. He, he did this in Moral Foundations Theory, but you can also look at Jordan Peterson's got it in his personality, Big Five Personality Types. Is there is a correlation between personality types and political leanings. Yes. And so all industries will group people by personality types. Creative industries, it's high trait openness and high agreeableness generally and uh, some other traits. But those correlate, as Jonathan H. Show, with what Haidt called the poet. So if you have a, an industry which is dominated by people who are creative, that means that they're going to have a specific leaning politically. In the same Wall Street is going to be dominated by high trade conscientiousness and people who are probably, it's probably completely free market, neoliberal. Huh. Because, and, and, and then on top of that, you have groupthink for community groupthink. So you have all these things compounding each other. The thing that's slightly weirder with the, the creative industries is that you'd think they'd be high in trade or high in, in openness to ideas, which is slightly different to right. openness or com right. high compassion. It's a, it is not slightly different. It's completely different. And you would think that they would be like that. And I think that there are some groups, but unfortunately those people are self-censoring within the industry. But so, so I say all this to say, if it wasn't already as a, 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 not already implicit, which is that we see Hollywood, or today I see a tweet by Obama with um, Jason Bateman and on his podcast with Clinton and, and, um, and Biden doing like, why you have to vote for Biden yeah. again? And basically shilling for the establishment left, which is cringe to me from a rock and roll point of view. Right. It's like, I thought that rock and roll and Hollywood are supposed to be anti-establishment. Yeah. No, they are the establishment, but right. they don't even see it because right. their political leaning is that way naturally anyway, because of their character dispositions. Hmm. Um, and and then I also just don't think I think that the bubble that they're all in they don't they're not oh, they're, they're not exposed necessarily to all those ideas I don't know I'm these are all high, I'm theor I, theorizing and maybe and pontificating I don't know like what's actually but that's my well, impression Stephen Colbert I mean you look at the late night hosts and it, it feels like they're DNC operatives at this point you know yeah. where it's like well. We are running out of time. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on your show. Oh, my goodness. This was a joy. Um, Congratulations on all the success. Long well, we hope, we hope we're hope we grateful yeah. to the Roka community. we got to keep going. We're just starting off this show. Yeah. Um, and They'll be eager to hear your story. I mean, I mean a lot of them already know it, but to hear it from you directly. Are you going to come to Distant Dialogues? We would love to. That'd be We'd terrific. We'd be honored to. What, awesome. Well, let's hang then. That'd be great. My brother literally texted me this week and asked me if I want to buy a ticket. Well, so, doesn't need to buy one. Well, no. Stop, stop, stop. Please invite your brother. No, no, no. Uh, he'll, he, he'll stay home. He'll stay home. No, seriously. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, what do you mean? No, no I'll bring. I'll bring. I'll bring. All right, bring but, but this, this has been amazing. This has been amazing to talk to you, and we will be there. And to anyone who watches and listens, check it. We out. encourage you to check it out as well. Dissidentdialogues.org.
tickets still going yet. Day tickets. We've mentioned already. I'm going to do this. Do it. So, so we've mentioned Dawkins and <laughs> Ian. Uh, we've got Lee Fong and Michael Schellenberger's doing a keynote. Yep. Aisha Akami, John McWhorter, 